around. I wanted the pastor to element. Why don't you stand with me as you pass that ball around for the reading of God's word? Uh, this is James chapter 5, verse 12, and it says, But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would take us today and teach us what it means to be simply an honest people who are open before you and open before others, that you would move us and walk us in the ways of showing who you are to the world by how we live and trust you in all things. Amen. Have a seat. Now, you might be thinking, hey, what's the special message for Mother's Day? There's not. We're still in the book of James. And, and you can blame this all on Michelle G. over here. Because Michelle G., a couple years ago, she says, why do you always do special messages on Mother's Day? You should just keep doing whatever we're doing. And I go, Challenge accepted. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Now, we're only covering that one verse I had you stand for today. Uh, if you are newer to Element, we are going through the New Testament book of James. This is week 17. And I had finished writing the entire book of James and actually went back and added this message in because the verse I had you stand for, I tacked it onto the verses I had last week, but didn't even really talk about it. And I think that really does some disservice to the verse, trying to get through every verse. I just don't want to read it. I want I want you to know what it actually means. And I'm not trying just to make this series longer and longer. I do try to whittle some of these things down because I could talk about books of the Bible forever. Uh, but these verses are interesting because in the beginning of the book of James, it keeps coming back to this idea that there is a judgment coming. And the last chapters really go towards that. It starts talking about the coming day of the Lord, chapter 5, verse 9. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Other virgins will say the gates, but the doors make more sense to us. And so James James, what he does in this verse is he insists it is possible to incur a certain type of judgment because of the wrong type of speech. Now think about it. How easy is it for us today to add certain words to things that we say to bolster our credibility? Like we'll say, oh, dozens of people have said this, like because they're agreeing with you, when it may have only been one person and that person was you. You know, it's, it, it happens. To add an oath in James's day, what he is talking about would be to call on some supernatural being of some sort to come alongside you and bolster what you're saying. Oh, I swear to God, or so help me God. Today we have court proceedings, right? And people will say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Even like non-believers for a very long time, they still had that thing, oh, so help me God. I'm trying to tell the truth on what I'm talking about. And I find James's words here really interesting because what he is doing is he is actually quoting Jesus. Jesus gives this thing called the Sermon on the Mount. In the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, these are the words that he uses there. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, just like James. And what Jesus tells us when he says that is he says, any more than yes or no, you're not trying to bring upon you divine support, but really you're bringing divine judgment when you use God's name in vain. So following Jesus is what is supposed to lead us to what it's to be truly human in the world, to be God's image bearers as he made us to be, to live and walk in the world. And so we want to be a people who speak honestly. We don't want to be like Peter a couple weeks ago who denies Jesus by an oath and swears about it because usually when you bring oaths into it, it doesn't lead to anything good. If you have a Bible, open to Matthew chapter 5, not James chapter 5. That is on page 526 if you have an element Bible. And we'll come back to James's verse at the very end. But I'm going to talk to you about what Jesus actually says here. And really, this is from a message I gave in the Sermon on the Mount like eight or nine years ago. If you were here, you may not remember it because you don't remember what I said last week. And if you weren't here, it's all new for you anyway. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one body. Now, of winners one another. This is the idea that we are supposed to be truthful with each other. So what does Jesus say? Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Jesus says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take any oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. I know you think you can by dyeing it, but the follicle is still the same color. <laughs> Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And again, so Jesus is taking these words, and sometimes you try to use our words to convince other people 
that we are more trustworthy than we actually are. And so Jesus is talking about how to use our words and our speech in the world in a way that reflects who God is. Now, if you'll indulge me just for a couple minutes here, I just want to talk to you about words and what they do before we really specifically talk about what Jesus says. Because I think words are amazing. If you like to read, you know words can open up whole new worlds. If you've ever been made fun of or torn down, you know words can destroy whole worlds as well. When I was putting this message together, I'm reading this book by Annie Dillard. Some people love Annie Dillard. Some people hate Annie Dillard. I think she's great. I think she's funny and eccentric and all that. But she writes in this book called Teaching a Stone to talk, she puts crazy words to her thoughts about who God is. And this is, this is how she uses her words. The mountains are great stone bells. They cling together like nuns. And this is that the mountains are speaking of the majesty of God because they're so large and so amazing, and yet they're silent like nuns. She says, who shuts the stars? There are a thousand million galaxies easily seen in the Palomar reflector. Collisions between and among them do, of course, occur, but these collisions are very long and silent slides. It's like you can see the majesties of the heavens and the stars are doing things, but it's silent, yet it speaks of the majesty of God. She says, billions of stars sift among each other, untouched, too distant even to be moved, heedless as always, hushed. The sea pronounces something over and over in a hoarse whisper. I cannot quite make it out, but God knows I've tried. You drive around you and you see the ocean like all those people who don't live here, and they come around the corner of Avila and they all stop. And it's like, ah, oh, what are you guys doing? Because there's a majesty to the ocean and it speaks. And it's like this hoarse whisper of, she goes, oh, I tried to make it out, but I, I, I don't want to. She goes, at a certain point, you say to the woods, to the sea, to the mountains, the world, now I am ready. Now I will stop and be wholly attentive. That is why I take walks, to keep an eye on things. It's, it's beautiful, and I love the way that she writes. How many of you have gone for a walk, and you've seen the mountains or the oceans or the sky above you or at night, and the, and the stars are so bright, and it's so amazing? Do you stop and think about the crazy wonder of it all, that God's goodness is so great, that God has done these great things for us to see? This is why Dellard says, the mountains are like great stone bells. They cling together like nuns. They speak so loudly of the majesty of God, and yet they're silent like nuns. Good words can put your feelings into ways that other people can experience. Sometimes you can put your life into perspective so other people can walk through it with you. Sometimes you take a collage of these random images and it tells these stories so people can enter in in a moment of time, and it's beautiful. And that's what good words can do. But words can also do other things. There are people who use words and just pile more words on top of more words, and they stop make any, any sense whatsoever. A while ago, somebody gave me this book called The Soul of Christianity, and this guy just piles words upon words upon words. This is what he says in this book. The infinite has doorways, but not doors. The infinite includes the finite, or we would be left with infinite plus finite, and the infinite would not be what it claims to be. The natural image to depict the infinite's inclusiveness is a circle, an all-including circle that encompasses our finite universe out of which it is impossible to fall. It's like, what? 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 Yeah, anybody get that? No, it's written by this guy named Houston Smith. Houston Smith is a liberal theologian who throws in a lot of words. He says he believes everything and nothing at the same time and really just detracts from who Jesus is. And words can do that, though. Words can detract from the central premise and message of what we want to say. When you read the scriptures, I love the scriptures because they're just so straightforward and beautiful. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else and all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I love that because it's like a marching band right through your living room going bong, 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 bong. God's love is bigger than this and it's more awesome than this and it's greater than that. And boom, and it just keeps going and going. Those are words used in good ways. I also love comedians who have like little one-liners and like Stephen Wright, you know where that guy is? This is one of the things he says. He goes, everywhere is within walking distance if you have enough time. You can use words in good ways. So words, okay, so Jesus here is going to talk about words, and I think words can be used in beautiful ways and really in non-beautiful ways as well. But look at, let's look at what Jesus says about it. So back to Matthew 5, 33 and 37. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And by extension, 
imagine when James talks about this, he says that there's a type of judgment that comes upon our speech that we use. Now, if you're to study people who talk about these verses in James and what Jesus says here, there are two main schools of thought. I'm going to give you both. Uh, the first one is this. They say Jesus is forbidding any sort of oath or vow to anything. No, I pledge allegiance to the flag. No vows. I'm not going to perjure myself or anything like that. One person actually wrote this. This is the most silent and dangerous command because it puts you at odds with every government and institution because you refuse to take any oath. And this has led to a long Christian tradition among some places and movements that refuse to take any type of oath whatsoever. They will even quote when Jesus is on trial in Matthew 26, verses 63 and 64. The high priest will come to Jesus and say, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And this is like saying, swear to me that this is who you are. Jesus said, you have said so. And they say, see, Jesus wouldn't take an oath. He wouldn't step into that, so we shouldn't take an oath either. So there is this whole long tradition of commentary along those lines. Uh, George Fox, who's the founder of the Quakers, gives this famous uh, line to judges in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, when they asked him to swear he was telling the truth on the Bible, and he refused to do it because he wasn't going to swear an oath. He says, you've given me a book here to kiss and swear on, and this book which you have given me to kiss says, kiss the sun. And the sun says in this book, swear not at all. Now I say, as the book says, and yet you imprison me? How chance you do not imprison the book for saying so? Like, throw me in jail, got to throw the Bible in jail. It's probably not, though, how Jesus meant it. <laughs> I just disagree with George Fox. Yes, I did. Okay, the other way that this could be understood, and I would say the right way, deals with the context. And this is one of the reasons in two weeks we're going to start a series called Never Read a Bible Verse. And it's all about taking everything in the Bible in context. Don't just read one verse out of context. Take the whole thing. So in context, Jesus starts with, you've heard that it was said to those of old. And if you've been at Element any length of time, hopefully you think, oh, what was said to those of old? That's hopefully where your mind starts to go. Is he quoting someone? What, what did they say? Jesus says, they said, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. And so what Jesus and James both do is take a whole lot of things out of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the law, and they summarize them. Exodus 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That means misuse God's name. Don't proclaim something in God's name that is not true. This is not the word God with the word damn at the end of it. That's not what this is. This is proclaiming something is true that you know is not true and trying to attach God's name to to it. Leviticus 19 verse 12, you shall not swear falsely, you shall not swear by my name falsely. Numbers 30 verse 2, if a man bows a bow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. Deuteronomy 5 11, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. And so Jesus takes all of this line of thinking that has been all through the law and the Torah and all of that, and he talks about going back on oaths you have made. And he says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely. But I say, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem. This is essentially the idea of stop piling on useless, meaningless words. What happened in Jesus' day is people would make huge oaths or vows to God or to one another. And they knew that they were going to be unable to fulfill those vows. And when they got out of it, they would say, well, I didn't technically make the vow because I'm not bound by these certain things that I swore by. Uh, one commentator like calls it the weasel factor because they're always trying to weasel out of something. So the ancient tradition of making vows to other people in God was very abused in Jesus' day. And I will show you. Open to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter, there's actually extra biblical accounts of this, but I'm going to show you from the Bible when Jesus specifically talks about this. Uh, Matthew 23, Jesus is talking to religious leaders. And at, again, at this time they're having these detailed discussions about what type of vow you had to fulfill, what type of vow you could get out of, like what has a loophole and what's not binding to you. Matthew 23, starting in verse 16, Jesus says this. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold in the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? Second example, verse 18. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it, and whoever swears by the heavens swears by the throne of God and him who sits upon it. And at this point, you're thinking, what? 
I am thoroughly confused right now about what is going on. Okay, so in this time, if you were to say to me or somebody else, I will be there next week. And we said, really? Are you really going to be there next week? Because sometimes you say that you don't really show up. And you say, I swear by the temple I will be there. Go, oh, okay, I swear by the temple. That, that's amazing. But then you didn't show up next week. And you're like, but you didn't show up. And you could say, well, I swore by the temple, but not the gold in the temple. If I swore by the gold in the temple, then I'd really have to be there. But since I only swore by the temple and not the gold in the temple, I didn't have to be there. That's what was happening. Uh, if if uh, you said, oh, I swear by the altar, I did not see what happened on Mulberry Street. And then all of a sudden, it's like you did see what happened on Mulberry Street. You could be like, oh, but you know, I only swore by the altar, not the gift on the altar. If I swore by the gift on the altar and I lied, well, then you could hold me accountable, but you can't. There's all these extra biblical examples of people who are swearing by heaven and earth. Oh, I swear by heaven and earth, and I'll give it to you. But you didn't give it to them. You could say, well, I only swore by heaven and earth. It wasn't binding. In the Mishnah, which is rabbinical commentary on, on the Old Testament, much of it is considered legal documents. And they said, if you swore by Jerusalem, it was not binding. If you swore to Jerusalem, it was binding. Weird, right? There are these extensive tracks in the Mishnah arguing back and forth. Is it up, upon, to, for, by? And it's like, no, yes, no, no, yes. You know, you may be thinking, what kind of primitive thinking is this? What Jesus is saying is these people are trying to make oaths to get people to believe them, knowing they're not going to fulfill their oath in the first place. They're lying, but trying to bring God into it in the midst of their lies. You know, we would never do that. Okay. Let's talk about this. Um, I swear to you I'm telling the truth. Oh, oh, I know you lied before. Okay, I swear to God I'm telling you the truth. Uh, well, I don't know. Okay, well, I swear with, to God with my hand on a Bible I'm telling you the truth. Eh, I swear to God with my hand on a stack of Bibles I'm telling you the truth. Hold on. I swear to God with my hand on two stacks of Bibles with my foot on my grandmother's grave. I am telling you the truth. Standing in front of an American flag, singing the Pledge of Allegiance. I am telling the truth. I swear to God, I am on all that's holy. I'm telling you the truth. And then we found out you lied. You'd be like, oh, but I had my fingers crossed under one of those stacks of Bibles. <laughs> that's what Jesus and James are both talking about right there. It's absurd. Oh, I swear by heaven and earth, by the temple and the altar, I'm telling the truth. Oh, but heaven and earth aren't binding. I didn't swear by the gift on the altar, the gold on the temple. Jesus wades into this. James wades into this and says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. The rest of this is just stupid. How refreshing is that? It's very refreshing. So you go to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking about these things, yes and BS and, and no be no. And in the Sermon on the Mount, there is this theme. It's how God's people are meant to live in the world. Have you seen that theme in the book of James? Of course we have. Do we believe what we say we believe? Do we actually live these things out? Is, is my face shown by what I do, by how truthful I am, by how I live in front of other people? That's the questions. And so when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes from blessing, he goes to fulfillment of the law, anger and murder, lust, adultery, divorce, because divorce is rupturing of an oath, then revenge, love for enemies, true good deeds, not deeds to puff yourself up, that, but that make God look good, how to pray, committing our household tensions to God, and this is where James will actually go next week is, is prayer. And you see again and again, Jesus comes back and he's covering all aspects of how we live as God's people in the world. And he teaches us to commit all things to God himself in a Christ honoring way. We do not have to be anxious about who we are because we know who we are in Christ. We are God's children. And I'll tell you, we need that now more than ever because we are so thrown in so many directions today. Getting to oaths, he talks about forgiveness, restoration, lust, anger, the past, the present. And he is showing how to use our language and words and use them in a non-anxious, God-honoring way in the world. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what James is saying. There's a proper way to use our words and language. And then there are other ways to use our words and language. Not that, not that everything you say and do, you can't like stumble every once in a while, but we are people who are meant to be honest in what we say. Jesus isn't saying you can't make a promise or you can't make a vow or an oath. He's saying, but think about it when you do. If you swear at all by all these other things, you might want to rethink things. If you have to say, no, 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 seriously, I, I swear it's true. You might want to pause and ask, why do I need to add words? Why am I so untrustworthy? What have I done in my life? How does my life need to change? Why can't I just say it's true? Uh, a few years ago, I was, I was doing a message, 
obviously. And uh, after, in the middle of it, I told this story. And I said, oh, I swear to God, this is true. And I told this story. And somebody came up afterwards very kindly, and they said, why'd you need to swear to God that was true? And I'm like, ooh, yeah, you're right. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Why do I need to bring God in, in the midst of it? Sometimes the reason we add words is we are aware of our own anxiousness or our own lack of credibility. So we bring other things in to bolster that credibility. See, when Jesus and, John, uh, Jesus and James both say, let your yes be yes and your no be no, it's beautiful. Josephus, who is a first century historian, started out as a Pharisee. He talks about these people known as the Essenes. He writes this, the Essenes say the one who has not believed without an appeal to God stands condemned already. Ooh, good words, right? The one who has not believed without an appeal to God stands condemned already. It's like if you have to drag God into it, swear on the altar, the, the gift on the altar, the gold on the temple to grab a stack of Bibles to stand in your grandmother's grave, then there's a character issue. And words aren't going to fix it. What Jesus is saying is words are not fulfilling in your gaps in character. That's what they're saying here. The idea is that we would be a people who do live in God's world as salt and light, that we don't have to be anxious because we're held by God himself, that we can be peaceful and full of hope and trusting that Jesus is who he says he is and that we are a people who are free to simply live and let our yes be yes and our no be no, that we wouldn't have to add extra words to bolster our credibility. Do we believe what we really say we believe. There are healthy ways to use our words for edification, and there are ways to use our words that come from our anxiety and our lack of knowledge, and even worse, I think, our lack of character. And if we cannot convince other people the truth of how we are living, the believability of what we say we believe not by our lives, if people can't see it from how we live, well, our words aren't going to help in that. So here are two things. I put them in your notes that you have. First, again, words are not for filling gaps in character. And secondly, words are not for managing or manipulating other people into agreeing with you. Okay? Words are not for managing or manipulating other people into agreeing with you with you. Now, we do this in large ways and small ways. Like, you know, in, in very mundane ways, like small ways, we still do this. I love it when I meet, you know, young adults who they are finally realizing that, like, Toy Story or Frozen wasn't the first movie ever made, or uh, <laughs> Hayden Christensen isn't the first guy to play Darth Vader, or Ewan McGregor isn't the first Obi-Wan Kenobi. I know, God forbid. You know, I, and I love talking about stuff like TV shows and stuff, but I realize I can really be a hype machine when it comes to certain things like this. And I found that the older I get, the, the less younger people have allegiances to my taste in TVs and movies and things like that. And I don't have any of theirs either, because they all love Hamilton, and I can't stand musicals. Sorry. I, I wouldn't mind go watching one, but man, I just, I, I cannot, but man, you get these kids and talk, oh, they start singing all the Hamilton songs, whatever. And I, and I keep telling myself, I'm not going to use my words to hype things. I'm just, I'm just going to say the things I like and not hype, but I, but I hype. It's like, if you have never seen Die Hard, it is the best movie ever made. And, <laughs> and it is, and I don't care if people say it is a Christmas movie because it was filmed in winter. And if you haven't seen it, it's the height of awesome, right? But the truth is, words are not for manipulating or managing people's perceptions. We are just meant to let our yes be yes and our no be no. We don't need to hype Jesus. We need to live for who he is in our lives. You ever meet someone that maybe a friend of yours starts dating, and they totally hype this person up, and then you meet that person, you're like, man, they did not live up to the hype. Never have <laughs> Or maybe the exact opposite. You know somebody and they're constantly saying things about someone and tearing somebody down. And then you meet that person and you have all these walls up because you've heard all these terrible things. And you get to know them and they're not that bad. Yeah. Why do we do that? Why do we use our words to try and manipulate how people see others around us? See, control, that's about control. And control is a huge message in the Sermon on the Mount. And trusting Jesus is a huge message in the book of James. And what Jesus and James are getting at is that the heart of our language is typically a desire to manipulate or control others through our words. And we can hype something up or we can tear people down. If you don't like someone, why do we try to use so many words to make everybody else have the same experience that we had with that person? James 5.12, but above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is there anybody in your life that you have been trying to control or manipulate with your words? And we may not even realize we do it because we are surrounded with it every single day day. It's a natural part of our society because we have advertisements that come at us all the time. Head and shoulders says, helps control dandruff symptoms with regular use. Well, that'll come from washing your hair. Okay, but people do that. Cascade leaves ditches virtually spotless. Doesn't anything do that? 
Uh, years ago, Ford came out with this thing called the LTD, and they, this was their ad campaign. It's 700% quieter compared to what? Right? The FTC actually made them substantiate the claim, and what they said is, well, it's 700% quieter on the inside of the car versus the outside of the car. Oh. <laughs> Mobile calls itself the detergent gasoline. Any gasoline acts as a cleaning agent. There's even this gum, and I tried to find the ad, I couldn't find it, but there's this gum in this ad. It had someone smiling, pulled over by a cop, and it said, 35% more warnings. <laughs> Have you ever thought, I need to buy some gum so I can get out of more tickets? <laughs> I mean, I'd buy it if they had it, but you know. Why do we need to use our words to manipulate one another? But again, we aren't shocked. What we think is everybody has an angle. We think everybody lies. But here's the thing that Jesus and James are saying. What if not everybody lied? What if the people of God said, we are going to be honest and true? A group of people followed Jesus and said, my yes is yes and my no is no. And you can trust me in that. See, when James says, let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you may not fall under condemnation, that does not mean God's going to send you to hell. It means that God's spirit won't constantly have to rebuke us, that we won't fall under condemnation when others find out about our frivolous words. But it also means in the end that we can be truthful people. It means in the places where we have told lies, we have tried to manipulate others. We can be honest about that. See, James's push is Jesus is who he said he is. He is our savior. So we can live lives of honesty around people in the world. Uh, George MacDonald was a great writer and preacher. He wrote to his father in 1878. He was probably one of the greatest preachers of his day. And this is what he wrote to his father. I always try, I think I do, to be truthful. All the same, I tell a great many lies. His candidness is so refreshing because we will lie and then lie that we lied and then lie that we lied that we lied. We just, we just keep going on and on. But we are a people who can trust that our identity comes from Christ alone. And when it is in Christ, we can then be an honest people because we put our faith in Jesus and what he has done in the gospel. Kent Hughes writes this, we must remember that for Jesus, words are sacramental, an outward sign of an inward condition. Because of the gospel, we now have a lot, the life of Christ in us. And that means we get to live out in the world in ways that people can see who he is by how we live. Let our yes be yes. Let our no be no. Let our language be an authentic representation of who we are in Christ. That we get to be a people who trust and rest and be who he made us to be. And stop being so worried about what everybody else thinks. Stop trying to have to think you have to fill in the gaps with noise. Let the sounds we make be the sounds of grace. Because the point of language, the beauty of it, is to be able to communicate that God has communicated to us in the person of Christ so that we can speak about the goodness of that. And I know I just used a lot of words to convince you to use your words better. <laughs> but I think when we come to a place where we trust who Christ is with our lives, we are not anxious. We don't have to worry about what everybody else thinks. Did I say it right? Did it come out the right way? Did, we don't have to worry about that because our lives are found in Christ alone. And the way they are found in Christ alone is through the good news of the gospel. At Element, this is one of the reasons every week we come to the place of communion because it's a reminder of what Christ has done for us. We, entire, entirety of humanity, has run away from God and yet God came to rescue and save us. We could not save ourselves. God says the wages of sin is death, and we have sinned multiple times. And so we cannot pay for our sins, so Jesus pays for it on our behalf, and he bestows his righteousness to us as a gift. In communion, that's what we're reminded of. We are taking a cracker, and we are breaking it. And it is reminding us that Christ's body was broken for us. You dip it in the wine or the grape juice. It reminds us of Jesus' blood that was shed for us. This is the good news of the gospel, that Christ has come to rescue and save us. And I would encourage you to take communion today. There's, if, there's a gluten-free option in the back if you want that on that table there. If you are worried still about COVID, uh, we have single-use ones that are sealed and covered, so you can grab one of those and do a communion that way. But we'd love for you to be able to take communion this morning to remind yourself and remember remember who Christ is and what he has done so that we can be an honest and truthful people in the world. Thank you, Mark. Uh, if you need prayer, or maybe, maybe you are living your life today and you just have this huge anxiousness about everything that, that is around you, so you're always trying to cover yourself with your words. Well, I would encourage you to, to grab Sarah at the Welcome Center. We actually have people who sign up to pray for you if you have needs, and we will, we'd love to pray for you about that so that we can be a people who start to walk in honest ways to trust who Christ is and also so that we can have our yes be yes and our no be no. Uh, there's offering boxes next to every door. At Element, we do not pass a plate. 
It's always a response to what God has done. And so it's something you actually have to get up and do if you want to give. We just, we give because God has been so generous to us. God is the one who tells us the truth. And I love when Jesus speaks to people, he's always going, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Why? Because everybody lies. And he's like, I tell you the truth. And he does. And he says, I am going to rescue. I'm going to save. And he goes to the cross on our behalf to rescue and save us. God has said that from Genesis chapter 3. He promised that that would happen. And God is true for his promises. And we are a people who are not And yet, he still deems to love us anyway and bring us back to himself. So let's be a people who focus on what he has done, because that will lead us to a place of living grace. And I encourage you to grab those sermon notes, take those questions in there, uh, talk to your family, your friends, your gospel community about those, coming back to how we can be a more honest people in the world. I don't want you to be people who live in condemnation, like, oh, I've lied, oh, I'm so terrible. I want you to live in the great hope that God loves you and restores you and redeems you and calls you to be his his ambassador to the world is hands and feet. I mean, you may, you may be a person who have never told the truth in your life. Starting right now today, you can change through the power of God's spirit. And what lies in front of you is the rest of your life. You know, I've got to spend it looking back at all the places and ways that you've lived dishonestly in the past. It's what God is doing in your future every day. And you can trust him for that now. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. Let's be a people who reflect who he is. Let's pray. Father, this morning I ask on this Mother's Day (laughs) that you would make us be a people who understand the great gifts you have given to us. You've given us gifts not just of our mothers or people who have stepped into the place of motherhood in our lives, but most importantly, you've given the gift of yourself to us that brings us back into relationship with you. And so today, teach us to be a people who aren't so worried about what everybody else thinks in the world, that we can love even when people hate us, that we can speak the truth even when everybody else wants to lie to us, that we'd be a people who reflect your grace and your mercy out into the world around us because we understand the great salvation that we have received. Teach us to be a people who live out what we say we believe. Have us be a people who can look at the words we say and be able to really see if we believe what we say we believe. But then always come back to understand the great grace that you have given us. Teach us to live in your hope. Teach us to be a people who trust you enough that our yes is yes and our no is no. And that would bring great glory to you as we trust you in all things. We ask this in your son's good name. Amen.